the NBA, and in particular, some of the notable offseason trades, offseason signings, because I think so far, a lot of the early dominoes have already fallen. You can look at all the moves. We can analyze them. So far, we can decide which teams have made exceptional trades, other teams that have made ones that are a little bit more quizzical and a little bit more perplexing, maybe surprise trades. And there have been a couple teams that have had an off season that's surprisingly been underrated. So I want to start with some really good trades. In fact, I want to start with the trade that, to me, has been the best trade so far this offseason. Now, mind you, I'm factoring in expectations of the player coming back in return. We're factoring in the best fit for the team. We're factoring in the environment that the player is joining. And for me, the trade that I love the most so far is the Celtics acquiring Malcolm Brogdon. I thought this was an absolutely fantastic trade. In return, they send to the Indiana Pacers, Aaron Neesmith, Daniel Tice, a 2023 first-round draft pick, Nick Stauskas, and a couple other chili flakes sprinkled on top. But essentially, Aaron Neesmith, Daniel Tice, and the 2023 first-round draft pick are the picks. Now, to me, when you look at the Celtics, what was their biggest area of need? Well, their biggest area of need was playmaking at the point guard position because they needed someone who's a stable ball handler who could playmake for himself and others and not turn the ball over. And I think when you looked at the finals last year and just a couple months ago, that was the biggest Achilles heel. Derek White had his moments but couldn't produce enough in the finals, wasn't an elite enough score at the finals position. Marcus Smart obviously was battling through a nasty ankle sprain, but for him it was not turning the ball over. And I think Malcolm Brogdon is a perfect combination of size, of girth, of strength. He doesn't turn the ball over. He's a really good scorer, an elite defender when he's out there again takes care of the rock, takes care of the basketball, can get you into offensive sets, especially when the offense is stalling a little bit. And from the Celtics perspective, there's only upside from this because they're just simply taking a flyer. He's in the final year of a four-year $85 million contract. He's 6'5". He's 230 pounds. And really, they're not going to be asking him to do the same things that he's been asked to do in his other locations, whether it, whether it was Milwaukee, whether it was with the Pacers, he was asked to carry a more cumbersome load in those previous two destinations than he's going to be asked to do with the Celtics. So I really like this move for them. He shoots it from the three-point line, 37%, 88% from the free throw line. He can go small. The Celtics can play small. They have a more versatile lineup now. He can either relieve the starters and ignite your bench, which is extremely potent and something that most teams in the NBA aren't going to have. Or you can play them alongside Marcus Smart and Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum and Al Horford or Robert Williams. Whichever combination that you'd like, they still have White. They still have depth. They still have Peyton Pritchard. They still have Grant Williams. Their core is still intact, and you're just dropping in Malcolm Brogdon. I thought it was an absolutely shrewd move by Brad Stevens and the Celtics. And to me, so far, that's been the best trade given the value that you could be getting from the player, given the fit, and given the expectations of the team and what you're expecting from that player. I absolutely loved it for the Boston Celtics. Now, one of the moves to me that was the most surprising was the Timberwolves trading for Rudy Gobert. Now, obviously, we all know the Kings ransom that the Utah Jazz got in return. Malik Beasley, Patrick Beverly, Walker Kessler, Jared Vanderbilt, Leandro uh, Bolmero, and four future unprotected first-round picks. Now, to me, this isn't the biggest surprise simply because of the haul. Because, truthfully, when you look at all those guys, there's only a couple of them that actually play. Patrick Beverly plays. Malik Beasley plays. Jared Vanderbilt sparingly got some playing time. We don't know anything about Walker Kessler. And obviously, Bolmero 
didn't play significantly enough last year. So as far as what stands out in this trade, obviously it's the four unprotected first round picks. That's that's the hefty part. But it's not just about the volume of assets to me that stands out. It's not just about the volume of assets that the Utah Jazz are acquiring, but or is it about all those picks and those players that the Timberwolves have essentially just jettisoned off? What stands out to me is the fit. Because what the NBA revealed last year was it's so critical what the fit is of guys, how players play with one another. If there's anything that the Lakers and the Nets told us from last season is that you can't just drop in a bunch of talent and expect the final dish to taste good. We saw that wasn't the case. It's all about the fit. And the way that the NBA game is changing right now and how it's going a little bit smaller, having Carl Anthony Towns as a center playing alongside Rudy Gobert, to me, just from a fit perspective, doesn't seem like the best fit. I understand that their interior defense will get substantially better, but if you're hoping that Carl Anthony Towns and Rudy Gobert can consistently switch out onto the perimeter to take on wings and guards, that just seems like a potential liability and not one that I'm willing to spend and take a $47 million flyer on at this particular moment in time. So that was... That was a trade that to me was a little bit surprising, not just again for the number of assets, but simply from the fit. And we saw Gobert in the postseason last year against the Mavs. He was on an island by himself, and it wasn't all his fault. The wings on on the perimeter basically gave him a free pass. The Mavericks players a free pass to the basket. It wasn't Gobert's fault, but he got a little bit exposed, and he hasn't been necessarily playing better every single postseason. So, Carl Anthony Towns and Gobert, how's that going to fit? I don't know. Uh, Anthony Edwards even at one point last season ridiculed Gobert when he was playing for Utah about kind of his defense, disparaging him a little bit. Now they're teammates all of a sudden. We'll see if they can mend that. But, again, unless you're telling me that he's Joel Embiid, Nikola Jokic, Anthony Davis, even Carl Anthony Towns, I'm probably not going to stomach it. I just don't think it's not that the center position shouldn't be valued because it should. I I do think that guys like DeAndre Aiden and Clint Capella, that they are valuable players. Robert Williams, they're valuable parts of your team, but they're not valuable to the point where I want to pay him $47 million. Personally, I just don't, just don't want to do that. Unless you're Shaq, unless you're Hakeem, unless you're Dikembe Mutombo, Maybe even Yao Mang to a lesser degree, but he's not one of those guys. He doesn't have the offensive repertoire to back that up, in my opinion. So for me, that was a perplexing, perplexing uh, move. And finally, the most underrated team kind of in the offseason, just going to take a minute on this, and then I'm, I'm bringing my guest Joaquin Wallace onto the show, was the Sacramento Kings. I absolutely think that they have, they've had a fantastic offseason so far. Nothing too extraordinary, nothing notable to most casual NBA fans. But if you're following the game, I think that they've had a fantastic, really six to seven months. I thought initially trading for DeMontis Sabonis was a nice move to see what they have with De'Aaron Fox. I really like their draft kit, their draft pick. Keegan Murray out of Iowa, 6'8", versatile, big, who can shoot the three ball at a 40% clip. He averaged 23.5 points per game last year at Iowa, so he can score. Then they signed Malik Monk, two years, 19 million. He had a breakout season with the Lakers. And if you're just asking him to go out there and score coming off the bench, that's that's what he does best. Sure, he's not the best defender, but he'll keep you relevant as far as keeping you within striking distance in a game, you can go on individual salvos. And then you traded for Kevin Herter, which I thought was one of the most underrated trades this offseason. I think he's more than just a sniper. He's fearless. He can put the ball on the floor. He spaces the floor well. But he's not just a catch-and-shoot guy, which I think is the big 
is the big trait of his that I really like is the fact that he can actually create a shot for himself and others. And so I, I thought that he was a great addition, 38% from the three-point line, and he's fearless. 27 points, game seven, and that infamous for the, for the Philadelphia 76ers, game seven road win for the Hawks. He dropped 27 points in that closeout game. So he's capable of popping off in the postseason. And I was surprised that the Hawks decided to let him go, but you add him to Malik Monk, to Sabonis, De'Aaron Fox, Rashawn Holmes, an emerging center. Harrison Barnes is still a stable veteran. They've got some guys there, and I'm really, I've really kind of liked what the Sacramento Kings have managed to put together so far this offseason. Again, it's not world beaters. They're not going to become world beaters and contenders in the West necessarily, but you still have Davian Mitchell. I just like some of the pieces that they've been slowly and slowly accruing over the last six or seven months.